Now, if you uh, take your Bibles and uh, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 12, we've been working our way through the, the Gospel of Luke, and uh, we're up to this portion in chapter 12. And before we read that, I just want to say the, the Christian must realize that his life, my life, is not my own. I've been purchased by the Lord Jesus to belong to him. And as a result of that, I must live day by day in service to him, thinking, what does he want me to do? How does he want me to live? And part of the answer is found in this passage in Luke chapter 12. And that is to live in anticipation of his coming. Jesus has gone away into heaven, and he told his disciples he was going to prepare a place for us, but that he would come again and receive his own to himself that we might be together. There are many places in the New Testament that speak of the, the appearing of the revelation of the Lord Jesus. Do we believe that Jesus is coming again? Do we live in anticipation of that? Is it your blessed hope? We are to be prepared. We are to live in readiness, an, an eagerness that comes from a devotion and commitment to our Master. Luke chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 35. Let your waist be girded, and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. What if that servant says in his heart, my master's delayed his coming, and he begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants and to eat and drink and be drunk? The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many blows. But he who did not know yet committed things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few. For every one to whom much is given from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. The section that we're looking at today comes immediately after a section where Jesus was telling his, his people not to live for the things of this world, not to be covetous, not to be wanting more and more. But not only that, not to be 
full of anxiety and worry about how your needs are going to be met. But he says in verse 31, to seek the kingdom of God. And he reassures them that it is their father's good pleasure to give to them the kingdom. This is what, what God is seeking to do. He, God is going to give them the kingdom and he wants them to seek that above everything else in their life, to, to lay up their treasure in the heavens. Because he says, where your heart is, there, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we see in this passage a, a servant whose heart is inclined towards his master. And that causes him to have faithful service to his master. He's, he's waiting and he's watching for him to come because he earnestly desires to please that master. Verse 35 in the translation that I'm reading from speaks about the, the loins or the waist being girded and the lamps burning. If you're looking at, a, at another translation, perhaps it speaks of being ready for service or dressed for service. Uh, the metaphor here speaks of the, the long robes that were worn at that particular time. And the long robe all the way down to the feet or the ankles, but the, then the hem or the skirt of that would be picked up and tied into a belt or a sash worn around the waist in order to facilitate work and activity. If you were going to go on a journey, if you were going to run somewhere, or you were going to engage in some kind of strenuous activity, you didn't want that down there around your ankles, getting you bound up and, and tied up. I suppose our metaphor of, you know, when we talk about somebody rolling up their sleeves is kind of a similar kind of picture to us. It's, it's about being ready to work. Uh, some of the translations uh, talk about being dressed for service, but the idea isn't so much uh, about work clothes as it is about so much about work clothes as about getting uh, ready to be involved in vigorous activity. The things that would encumber or impede your activity are to be tied up and out of the way in order to be ready for service. And the second thing he talks about there is the lamps burning, being ready for the night. And again, we have to think about this because we live in a society that to turn on a light is just a matter of you flip a switch and on it comes. We're very used to that until the power goes out. But, you know, they lived in very different times. And the, the wick had to be trimmed and, and the lamp filled with oil and then lit and burning in order to have light in the darkness. And again, this speaks of preparation and readiness. And he says that you're to have your, your waist girded for service and your, your lamps burning so that you can be like men that are waiting for the master to return. Uh, the master is out at a wedding, and I don't know for sure, there are different people have different ideas why specifically a wedding, but certainly it would be a, a joyous occasion. But I think also perhaps because it would be an extended celebration. Uh, some of the biblical uh, examples, and again this would be something very different from our culture, but, but a wedding feast in the two examples that I can think of, talk about going seven days. Now, whether every wedding feast was that long or not, I don't know. But I suppose it, it gives a sense of uncertainty as to the exact time that it was going to finish up and when the master would arrive home. And again, bear in mind that there are, were no uh, find my friend app on your phone that you could find out where the master is. You can't just ring up and say, look, I'm running late, I'll be home about 10 o'clock. They don't know exactly when he is going to get back. And the door would be locked and barred from the inside, and it's not a simple matter of just pulling out your keys and unlocking the door and letting yourself in. You need somebody on the inside to move the bar away and to unlock the door and let you in. 
And then once you're inside, you need lamps to be able to see, to, to get around. And on the way home, depending on the time of, of year, you might have the moonlight to be able to come home, but certainly once you're inside, you would need lamps to be able to see. And, and he talks about these men, these servants who are waiting for the arrival of the master, so that when he knocks, they can open to him immediately. They're not sleeping and need to be awakened, and then they can come stumbling through the dark to open up the door. They're waiting so that as soon as he arrives, as soon as he knocks, they're ready to open the door. And Jesus says that kind of a person, those kind of servants are blessed. When he finds them waiting and watching, he is going to be well pleased because it is a mark of their faithfulness and their devotion to the one who is their master. They, they stayed up, they waited up so that they could let him in as soon as he arrives. And he says they would be especially blessed if he comes late into the night. It speaks in this passage about the second watch or the third watch. And depending on how, whether we're looking at the Jewish rendering or the Roman, uh, Jewish rendering would have had three watches through the night. Uh, the Roman one, I'm told, had four different ones. So the, the second in the Roman system of, of uh, keeping track of this, the second watch would have been the from 9 o'clock till midnight, and then the third watch from midnight to 3 a.m. We're looking at this with the Jewish system of three watches. Uh, the second would be from 10 to 2, and then the third would be from 2 until dawn in the morning. Now some of you, I never speak for this for my house, some people are well up into the second watch and sometimes into the third watch because they have computers to play and things that they can watch. But bear in mind that there are no televisions, there are no Netflix or computer games or anything like that to spend your time. And I know what happens at our house when the power goes out and the sun goes down, everybody goes to bed. I mean, what else is there to do? Now, admittedly, we're a bit addicted to electric power, and we don't know how to function. We can't think of what to do when we don't have it. Uh, that would have been different in that time. But, but again, people typically would, would go to bed, and yet here were these servants who were waiting up well into the night waiting for the master to come. Jesus says they're, they're blessed because it shows their dedication and their devotion. The only way that somebody does that is because you believe that the blessing and commendation of the master is better and more important than the sleep that you're giving up. You have to believe that your master is worth it and that he, his well done is, is worth the sacrifice that you're going to make. I mean, after all, most people would rather be in bed sleeping than sitting up ready to be active in serving. Except if the master's being well pleased is going to give some commendation that is more than my own comfort and satisfaction. Jesus says the master is pleased, so pleased that he does something remarkable, something that is astounding. The master, he says, girds himself. In other words, he ties up his robe ready to serve them. He causes the servants to sit at the table, and the master waits on them. I'm not quite sure how to picture this, whether... They have dinner prepared for him when he's come home that late at night and he then tells them to sit at the table and serves them. Although the fact that he's coming back from a wedding makes me less inclined to think that they've got a meal prepared for him when he gets home, unless it was a, a long journey. But maybe it's something later on as a way of, of honoring them for their service. But he, he causes them to, to sit down. 
and he serves them. And, and I say that that's something that is remarkable, would have been almost shocking to people of the society of that day, that the master would serve while the servants sat at the table. There's an old song, I heard it played on a, on a program that I listened to on Mondays, Maybe you know this song, maybe not. Brethren, we have met to worship. And one of the, the verses at the end of the song says, Then he'll call us all to heaven. At his table, we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us. And when you hear those words, that seems like that's wrong, like that's, that's backwards. We would not expect that Christ is going to serve us, and yet that the idea behind the lyrics of that song are based on, on this passage. That's the kind of master we serve. Later on in Luke chapter 22, verse 27, Jesus will ask his disciples, who is greater, the one that sits at the table or the one who serves? And he says, yet I am among you as the one who serves. And of course, we're aware of John chapter 13 on the night of the Last Supper, how Jesus got up from the table and tied a towel around his waist and filled a, a, a bowl, a basin with water and went around and washed each of the disciples' feet. That was to be a model, a, a demonstration of humble servants encouraging his disciples to be that kind of servant, to have that kind of a heart that is devoted to serving others. Not just when it's convenient, but even when it costs us something. To be ready to serve whenever, to be so devoted to the master that we're waiting and watching for him and faithfully doing the things that please him, what he wants us to to do. The second analogy or illustration that Jesus used also has to do with watching and readiness. But in this case, it focuses on the homeowner, the one who is the master of the house. And Jesus says, if the, if the master of the house knew that a thief was planning to break in, he would have watched in order to prevent being broken into. Somebody doesn't just go to bed if they're expecting that a thief is going to come and try to rob them. He's going to do whatever he can in order to try to prevent that. Verse 40 is the first explicit reference that Jesus is talking here about his coming. And he says, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. Jesus is comparing his coming to a thief in the night. And that's an, a, a, an illustration, a, a metaphor that's used a number of times in the New Testament. Of course, the idea of a thief in the night is not that he's coming to take what is not his, but that it will be unexpected, that he's going to come when they are unaware. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 2 Peter 3, 10 say that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Revelation 16, verse 15 are the words of the Lord himself. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. And that's what's being communicated here, to be ready, to be watching, because the Son of Man is coming. Don't be caught unawares. Don't be caught unprepared. And then Peter asked the question, are, are you saying this for, for us or for everyone? Who, who exactly are you talking to with these illustrations about being ready and being prepared? And Jesus doesn't directly answer, but he does as he often does, he answers a question with another question. 
And I suppose the reason that he does that is he wants us to think, and the question that he asks is, who is the faithful and wise steward that the master will make ruler of the household and put in charge, entrusted with the care to provide and give food at the appropriate time? Of course, the idea of a steward is someone who is a manager, somebody who looks after the property and financial affairs of somebody else. And the two characteristics that he refers to here, faithful and wise, would be key characteristics that you would want for somebody who is going to look after your property or your things. You want somebody that's going to be wise and make good decisions that's going to evaluate what, what is profitable, what is beneficial. It's going to try and cut areas of waste and, and increase the production and, and be as productive as you can possibly be. That, that takes wisdom to think ahead. It's also important to be faithful. Somebody who you can depend on, somebody who is honest. Somebody that's wise but not honest, somebody that's wise but not faithful might shrewdly figure ways to use that for his own purposes. You want somebody who is going to be faithful to do what is expected and faithful to do what is needed. And this person was entrusted with responsibility to, to provide food and, and we should look at this in a, in a spiritual sense of that's what Jesus is wanting his disciples, his followers to be involved in, in spiritually feeding others by communicating God's word. That's what it is that believers need to grow and in order to maintain your health and your strength. If the only food that you get from God's word is when you come here on Sunday, you're not very healthy. But you, people need to be in God's word and they need to be fed. And so he's focusing here on the responsibility that he gives to his followers to, to communicate God's word with others in order that his people would be growing and strengthening in their relationship with him. And Jesus says, blessed is that servant when his master will find him so doing when he comes, verse 43. He's doing exactly what the master wants him to do. He's being faithful to the task that he was assigned. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing, and as a result of that, he is blessed. The master is well pleased to find him so doing. And he gets a promotion. He's entrusted with more, greater things, additional responsibilities. He says I, he'll make him ruler over all that he has. Perhaps a picture here, if you know the story of Joseph in the Old Testament who had been sold into slavery. But he was somebody who showed himself to be faithful. And the Lord was with him and he prospered and he kept getting more and more responsibility until he was promoted over the entire household and over all that was in the fields. It says concerning his master Potiphar that he didn't know what he had except for the food that he ate. All had been put into Joseph's hands, into his care. And that's the picture here, the person who, who shows himself faithful to the task that he has been given, is given more responsibility. Later on in Luke, Luke 16, verse number 10, Jesus says that the one who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. If you want to be given responsibility, then you have to be faithful in doing the things that God has already given you to do. So who is that faithful and wise servant or steward? Who is that one who is faithful to do what is expected and what is well-pleasing to the master? He is blessed, he is honored, he is promoted. There's a but. Jesus says, if 
That servant says in his heart, look, my master's away. His coming is delayed. I'm not sure how long it's going to be till he gets back. But it's probably a ways off, and I can, I can just put off doing my responsibilities for a little while and just do as I please. No, concern, no need to concern myself with, with giving account of my responsibility in the here and now. And so he begins to live for himself. He begins to act as though he's the one that's in charge rather than being a servant of someone else. And he starts to beat up his fellow servants. Those same ones that he was tasked to ensure that they were looked after and provided for. But instead, he sees himself as the boss and he's ordering them around and abusing them. He's living a life that is completely focused on himself, eating and drinking and becoming drunken. Well, certainly, he needs to eat and drink just like everybody else, but the focus here is that he's, he's just living for himself, whatever pleases him. He's not being faithful and wise. He's being self-absorbed and self-centered, and he thinks that it's all about me. What do I want? What pleases me? What's fun for me? rather than what does the master want me to do? What does the master expect from me? What responsibilities have been entrusted to my care? Am I ready to serve? Am I watching expectantly? But he's not thinking of that. He's only thinking of himself. And Jesus says in that circumstance, the master of that servant is going to come unexpectedly. When he's not looking for him, when he's unaware that he's on his way and there is great judgment, and according to the level of the wickedness that is committed, he is punished. Some of the things that are described here are, are hard for us to think about in our, in our society, but it was certainly within the rights of a master to do to one who was his servant. It speaks here of the man being cut in two or cut to pieces and applied, uh, apportioned with the unfaithful or the unbelievers. Some of your translations maybe you use the word unfaithful. This one uses unbelievers. The same word means both of those things. And I think when you think about it, those two things are linked together. One's unbelief leads them to unfaithfulness. The reason he was unfaithful is that he didn't really believe. He didn't really believe that he would be accountable. He didn't really believe that there would be consequences. He didn't really believe that the Lord really meant what he had said. So he is treated as an unbeliever. And if you understand what the Bible has to say about that, that is terrible consequences. It is to be lost, it is to perish, it is to be doomed forever in the lake of fire. Very sobering thought. Other servants it speaks of as being beaten, and the, and the punishment here reflects the degree of responsibility. The one who was in charge, the, the manager, was treated most severely, but others, their, the severity of the consequences was linked with their knowledge of the Lord's will. The more you know, the more accountable. The more you know, the more responsible you are. The man who, who knew what he should do, who knew the master's will, but didn't prepare himself, he didn't get ready, and he didn't do what the master expected, he was dealt with most severely. There were others who did wrong things that were deserving of punishment, but because they did it in ignorance, they received a lesser punishment. Jesus concludes this section by saying, to whom much is given, much will be required to whom more is committed into their care, the more will be asked of them. They're more accountable, more responsible 
for failing to listen and to do as they should. The reality is, the fact that you are here this morning makes you more accountable than you would have been beforehand. Now maybe you think, maybe that's a reason I should have stayed home. I hope that you don't think of it that way because the reality is you have another opportunity to hear and to respond to Jesus' voice and Jesus' message that is speaking to you. But the reality is that we have people here today who are not just hearing this for the first time today, but you've heard it over and over. Some raised in a Christian home where you've been taught the things of God's Word. You've, you've been in church week after week, and you've heard sermon after sermon. You have a Bible of your own, whether or not you choose to read it. And you do know, you certainly should know, what is the Master's will. But are we doing it? Or are we unconcerned and living for ourselves without any thought of the Lord's coming? That someday I'm going to stand before him. And, and what if it were today? I suppose if the Lord came and we were all in church, we would at least feel good about that. But what if it was tonight at 8.30? Or tomorrow at 4? Or Saturday at noon? And you were called upon to give account of the things that you've been doing. And how have you spent your time and your energy? Have I done the things that he wants me to do? Have I used my time and my energy for myself? Or have I used it for Christ? Do I really believe that there is greater blessing in his well done than anything that I can enjoy in the here and now? Lord wants us to be those who love his appearing, to be ready for his service, our, our waist girded, our lamps burning, waiting and watching and eager for his return, using the days and the hours that he gives us until he comes again to be doing what he wants me to do, to be that one who is faithful and wise, a manager of the responsibilities that he has entrusted to my care. In that there is great blessing. Great blessing to those who will do what he wants us to do. The very somber consequences to those who ignore it. In closing, we're going to sing a song Maybe a new song to many of you. It's an old song written by Fanny Crosby. But it uses the things that Jesus is talking about here. That Jesus is coming to reward his servants. And are we waiting and watching for that time? Listen as we sing. Will Jesus find us watching?
desire is that we would be faithful servants of yours. That we would be wise, that we would love your appearing. And that we would be eagerly waiting because of our devotion to you. Lord, help us to put aside the things of this world that would distract us, and that would hinder us from serving you the way we should. And may we be willing to, whenever and however you call us to serve, to be faithful. To honestly ask ourselves, what is it that you want us to do today? And then to faithfully do. Dismiss us now with your blessing. May you watch over us and keep us and enable us by your grace to live the way you want us to live as your servants in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.